Welcome to the Faith Alive Show. My name is Jody Berg and I will be your host today. If this is the first time you're joining us, I would like to extend a special hello to you. And then Pastor Brent will continue his series on defending yourself. We're looking forward to hearing more practical points on how to defend ourselves from the enemy. We're going to hear a great testimony on a childlike faith to believe for a bike. And then Adam Bureau will enlighten us on the subject of dominion in our Messianic Moment segment. And then we're going to hear a powerful testimony on how a woman recovered from a stillborn birth. The Faith Alive Band will be blessing us with an original song by Bailey Radosky called Majesty. You don't want to miss one moment of this show. So sit back and let the glory of God come down and touch you where you're at. I will be back at the end of the show to pray with you. So Ephesians 6 tells us we're to take the shield of faith in every situation. This is not a one-time thing in our lives. Take the shield means take it. Everyone say take it. So take means you can take it or it also means you can what? You can lay it down. So I think we need to grab that shield and put it up. You should have a shield on your arm, right, all the time. How many of you have a shield? Yeah. Is it a shield of faith or is it a shield of something else? Is it a shield of logic, reasoning, atheistic, humanistic thinking? Or is it a shield of faith? That my God is with me. My God is for me. The reality is God is alive. Doesn't matter what's going on in my life. Everything that's coming against us or against humanity or in this world doesn't matter. God is still God. See, that's what we have to realize. It doesn't matter. If I don't get healed today, God is still God. If life doesn't turn out the way I want, God is still God. Faith is more. I think the real problem is when faith became the object of our desire. And when we brought faith to that level where it was just used to get something from God, and that's been perpetrated for a thousand years or I don't know how long, you know what, that's the part where people get off. They get funny because if, they don't, if it can't get them something, then they're prone to back off from it. Well, it didn't turn out the way I thought, or it didn't work out, or I gave my $2 in the offering and I never got something next week, and you know, I never, you understand what I'm saying? Even to say that, God never promised to meet all your greeds. He promised to meet all your needs. And I think that's one area where we all messed up too. So a lot of it is just our believing for things way, way out contrary to the word of God. So we have to take up the shield. Say, take it up. And I think if we don't take it up, we're going to be in real trouble. How many of you, if you were standing in a real flesh and blood battle... And there's arrows all over the place and spears being thrown and God knows what else is being hucked around. How many of you would just stand there? How many of you ever watched movies? You know, got those movies, lots of fighting, gore, killing, and all that going on. Guys, the smart guys put their shields up, didn't they? Say the smart guys. The other guys were doing something else, right? So it's funny, people, if you wouldn't do it in a real flesh and blood battle, you certainly got to learn how to do it now spiritually. Because you're just in the same battle. You're the same battle. Say the same battle. So the enemy, he's trying to get you to back off your faith. The shield of faith should not be a last resort. You know, it's like, has it come down to that? Do we have to believe God? No. You know what I'm saying? That, that shouldn't be our last resort. It shouldn't be Brian crying because we're going to pray to get the bike, you know. 
You guys remember that story? I love that story. I'm prone to repeat it because I just love it. If you don't know, it was Brian when he was a little boy asked Dr. Pierce if he could have a bike. It was a certain kind of bike. Right? I love this story. I've got to say it again. And then he said, well, no, but you said, let's, you said, let's pray. Right? And then Brian started bawling. And I, I love that story because it kind of depicts what people are like, you know. Uh, the last resort, well, let's pray. And of course, the kid's like, oh, I'm never going to get it, you know. But he did get the bike. The good news is he got the bike, right? So that's, it's a great story because he did get the bike. So I, I love that. But that, isn't that how we are as people? You know, we like it to come easy. And if it doesn't happen, you say, well, we've got to pray. Oh, geez. It's so hard. Well, you know what? It, and I'm not saying it's not because it is hard to walk by faith. I guess that's why not everybody does it. Because it is easy to let go of. It's hard. I really believe it's hard. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. If it was easy, it'd all be taken care of. If it was easy, everybody would be healed. Well, perfect. But it's not, is it? So to me, it's up to us. We work with God. It's not 100% foolproof because it's something of the heart. It's something that we work within ourselves cooperating with God, right? And it's a hard attitude. So that's why it's not, it's not set in stone. I think that's what gets people upset, you know, because it is a, it's, a, it's a spiritual force working in our hearts, out of our hearts. Hi, my name is Brian Pierce, and this is my story about my PK Ripper bike. So growing up, as a pastor's kid, I was the youngest of four children. Uh, there was a poverty mentality in the church back then um, where most people thought that the pastor should be poor to keep him humble. So a lot of our clothes and things that we had around the house uh, was mostly hand-me-downs or gifts that we got from uh, friends and family around us. Um, it was very rare that we had new things. Um, but when I was 10 years old, I asked my dad for a bike, so we went to the police auction uh, where we could find a bike that we could afford. And I remember seeing this frame, it was just the frame and it was called a PK Ripper. Um, so we bought the frame and we brought it home and we pieced it together, we, bought, we got wheels and we got uh, seat and handlebars and, and we, we actually made a pretty nice looking bike in the end and I loved that bike. But unfortunately, uh, a little while later, it got stolen, and I was devastated. I was crying, upset, and I went to my dad, and I asked him, what, we, what are we going to do? So instead of just running out and buying me a new bike, he uh, said these words to me that I still remember today. Um, he said, Brian, we're just going to have to trust God for a new bike. And that's when I really started to cry, because my frame of mind back then was that God wanted us to be poor, and he didn't want us to have good or new things. So I was uh, pretty distraught. Um, but the story does have a, uh, a happy ending, because two weeks later, the insurance broker called us and said that he was going to buy me a brand new bike and replace the one that was stolen. And there was only one like it in our city, and it was $600. Uh, and that was 33 years ago now. And so you can imagine how much that bike was worth. Um, so I, I learned a few things that day that, first of all, that God uh, even cares about the little things, even, even a 10-year-old's bike, and that he does want us to have good things, and he is a faithful God, and that he actually really does love us. And it kind of carries on to, my, to my, my life now that I can trust God for even bigger things than just a bike. But uh, he is a good and faithful God. And here's, here's a picture of um, my bike back then. Uh, as you can see, it has uh, pink wheels and a green frame, and it's called a PK Ripper, which, which was kind of funny because my initials, uh, I was a preacher's kid, and the PK stands for preacher's kid, and that was kind of my nickname, the PK Ripper. So as you can see, it has uh, pink rims and a green frame, and I love that bike. So this picture just reminds me of God's goodness for even a 10-year-old boy. Um, and how he can come through for us. Faith should not be a last resort. Say, not a last resort. It should be the first thing you do, you know. Every venture, everything, good, bad, ugly, put that shield out there. Whack that thing around, you know. 
And it says here, you will be able to extinguish. Let's read, let's keep reading. In every situation, take the shield of faith, and with it you will be able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. And I think this is the hardest part to grasp. I think this is why people fall away. I think this is why people struggle in their minds, is that we find it difficult to believe and understand that we have an enemy and he's firing things at you. I think that's beyond our comprehension. And I think the other thing is, is that we have been taught erroneously that faith stops everything. And I think that's where we struggle with. Faith does not stop what comes. It says you can put out the flaming arrows. Doesn't say stop them completely. Sometimes I think you can, but like a lot of times, they're going to hit you. They're going to start burning. They're going to hit you in the back. By the way, there is no shield for the backside. If you turn and run, if you turtle, if you take off, there is no shield for you. The moment you back off faith, you've lost your shield. You can't turn, you can't hide, you can't run off for another day, you can't drop your thing and take off. No, the moment you turn, the enemy's taking swing at you. And there's no protection for it. That's why you've got to stand and face. How many of you know that? You know, I'm a, I'm a hockey watcher. I watch hockey guys, and I love watching the lo so many guys block shots. You ever seen them block shots? And you know what? They almost never get hurt if they face the shot. Because all their padding's up front. But I see so many times they chicken. They, you know, they, because they, and they turn, and they get hit in the ankle, and this back, and the arm, and, the, and then they hurt, and they're crippled, and they're taken off. And we were taught when I grew up playing hockey, they said, face that shot. You have to have courage. You know the shot's coming. You can't close your eyes. You can't turn sideways. You can't expose the bear. Face it with the shields that are you wearing, right? See, there's no protection for the back. Same thing, and that's the same thing with faith. So if you're going to, you have to face every situation head on. And I think that's hard for us. Because most of the time our heads are reeling, our souls, our emotions, we're wondering, we're reeling from the effects of what's going on, that we can't even believe that this could be happening to me. How is this possible? I serve a great God. I know He's real. I've been born again. I've been spirit-filled. I go to a great church, da-da-da-da, and all of a sudden this has hit me. How is this even possible? And I think this is where a lot of people start to go astray. Because they just cannot grasp that this should have happened. How could God let this happen? If God is so good, how could he let this happen? How many of you want to know the answer to that one? Well, the answer is, it's not God. It was your fault. Adam and Eve gave it up a long time, the traitors, a long time ago. And we still struggle today for it. Yeah. People don't understand that. And you can go on the internet, you know, why is there bad stuff happening? People got all kinds of ideas. Hey, the problem was God gave dominion to man. Man gave it back to the devil. That's the bottom line. Even today, yes, Jesus came, paid the price, did all this and that. But you know what? We're the ones that have to enforce it here. It would be great if Jesus could just come and just enforce it. But he can't. And you know why he can't? Because it would be a foul play. The devil would cry, foul, you can't do that. God, you cannot come fix us up by your power and glory. Man messed it up. Man had to buy it back. And man has to work it out. And until that day Jesus comes and really sets up shop, it's a limited kingdom that we are involved in right now. And we can have as much of it or as little of it as we decide. But nonetheless, it still exists. The enemy is roaming the earth. He's prowling around like a roaring lion. And he's trying to devour you. For some reason, I don't understand everything. He still has the ability 
to tempt you and try you and test you and cause things to happen. And I think that's hard for us to grasp. I think Christian people think, you know, if Jesus came and died, how come this is still happening? Well, you know why it's still happening? Because God knows you have faith. And God knows that you will stand strong till the very end. We may not always like everything that we've been handed, but you know what? That's what we've been handed. Better to face it just right up front. Trust God. Amen? Trust God. Get the word in you, in the you and trust the Lord. Do not back off from your devotion. That's what he's after, guys. He's after your devotion. Shalom and welcome to Messianic Moment, where we strive to unlock the true meaning of the Bible by understanding its Hebrew cultural context. Our topic today takes us back right to the beginning of time. When God created the earth and the heavens and populated the earth with every sort of animal, he said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. You see, in the mind of God, man was supposed to be unique. He was the only creature created with the divine image. But what did it mean for man to bear the divine image? What did it mean to have the image and likeness of God? You see, God continued and clarified by saying that let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth. When God states that we will have dominion, the Hebrew word he used was rada. Now, that word means to tread down, to subjugate, to prevail against, to rule or to take. While these words might sound a little too aggressive for us, we might better understand them by understanding we have a partnership with God. He rules over us so that we can rule over his creation. He is Lord and owner of everything. We are his stewards that administer what he has. Many might assume that when man fell, we lost this God-given delegated authority. However, as we survey the Bible, we'll see that God still gave man dominion over the earth. One clear example of this is seen in Genesis chapter 9 when Noah exits the ark after the flood. While man certainly fell from the original glory given to him by God, God wasn't willing to abandon his purpose for mankind. That man indeed continued to execute dominion on the earth is evident in how the Lord expresses his expectations towards men. We see in Ezekiel 34, 4, that the Lord rebukes the leaders of Israel saying, The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you bound up the broken, nor have you brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled over them. The word here for ruled is that same word rada translated as dominion in Genesis chapter 1. Now Jesus makes this clear with his final words. Before he ascends into heaven, he commissions his disciples to establish his kingdom by healing the sick, seeking the lost, and making disciples. Matthew's gospel states that all authority has been given to me on heaven and in earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. God's purpose has never really changed. He's always intended that man would work alongside him, establishing his will, his dominion, or we might say his kingdom here on the earth. Thank you for joining us for this segment of Messianic Moment. Shalom. Hi, my name is Trina. And when I was 20 weeks pregnant, I went for a regular checkup to my doctor and everything felt fine and everything seemed fine but the baby um, they couldn't find a heartbeat so they sent me for some tests and they found out the baby wasn't alive anymore so I had to go to the hospital and they induced me so it was it was exactly as if you're full term um, I had to go through labor I felt all the pain and um, all the contractions and everything as if as if I was giving birth to a, a full-term baby though I remember that night feeling I kept telling my husband Ryan I said um, 
this is horrible because I know I don't have a prize after. I'm going through all this for nothing. I felt like, like I was gonna have to push out this baby and say goodbye and never really get to experience this baby or know the personality or anything. All these thoughts go through your mind. And the, the, the next couple days were the ho most horrible days ever. I remember I cried, I felt so empty inside. Um, I had so much hurt and so much pain. I had questions of why me and why is this happening to me and, and stuff like that. And I, I think it was a few days after that um, it was a Sunday morning, and I remember coming to church, and all through the service, I, I remember thinking, I just can't wait for this to be over, because I know once it's over, there'll be an altar call, and I can go up front and get hands laid on me and just pour my heart out to God and just ask Him to take all this hurt away and all this pain away. Well, it was the end of the service, and I went up to the front, and Pastor Brent and Pastor Barb put their hands on me and prayed prayed over me, and I remember I cried and cried and cried, and and cried my, bawled my eyes out, and when I got up, I went home and I, I told my husband Ryan, I said, you know, I don't have that hurt anymore, I don't have that pain anymore, that emptiness is gone, I'm not mourning, I'm not thinking about this baby anymore, I, I can feel happy now, like I just, I felt joyful, I felt peace, I could rest, I could sleep again, I didn't have, I didn't have, I honestly, I just, I felt so, so good inside. And I just want to say if anybody, if anybody out there is feeling any hurt from any loss of any kind, a baby like mine or, or anything, I just pray that God would just, that same, that how he touched my life and took that pain away, that he would do that same for you right now, that all that hurt and all that pain that you're feeling right now would go, and that God's love would come in there, that he would consume you with his presence, even right now, that you would feel his presence right now. In Jesus' name, amen.
Wasn't that a touching and heartwarming testimony of how God's glory can touch a grieving family? Jesus, you are so amazing. And as we build up our faith in you, may you continue to show us that in good times and in tough times, you are God and will continue to be God. And for anyone that is suffering from the loss of a child, I say in Jesus' name, be healed. May you restore them, Lord. Bring them back to where you need them to be. Take that grieving away. And Heavenly Father, bring back that joy. Bring back that joy that you desire in their lives. Next week, we're going to have a special episode for Thanksgiving. And you will be hearing exciting testimonies of people who have been healed and have encountered the wonderful presence of God. If you have a testimony by watching this show, or if you just want to get in touch with us, you can reach us at fafc.ca. If you're at all interested in joining our Bible college, you can reach us on our web at fabc.ca. We hope you enjoyed this show, and we hope you continue watching us. Remember, be good to each other, for as Jesus has blessed you, so you bless others. Have a great week. Steve and Kathy Gray, pastors of World Revival Church in Kansas City, are bringing this powerful move of God to Faith Alive Family Church for three power-packed nights. Experience the intensity that's caused thousands to rush the altars with visible demonstrations of power and healing. Mark your calendars for October 18th and 19th at 7 p.m., October 20th at 10 a.m., and a special leadership session October 19th at 1 p.m. Everyone deserves to experience the presence of God.